Um, thank you everyone for joining us. This is the CEGDC seminar, the second uh, installment. Today we have uh, Julie, oh man, Dini? I didn't ask how to pronounce your name, I'm sorry. How do I pronounce it? Dini. Dini. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Dini. Uh, from uh, CNRS, uh, Dini works in uh, shape analysis and geometry processing, and she will be the program chair of SGP this year. Um, and uh, Julie is going to talk about uh, shape analysis from local to non-local information and learning. So uh, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for inviting me and for this introduction. So today I'll talk about some work, uh, well, a series of work we did with uh, my student Johan Berzi and two colleagues from, uh, from Lyon. So it's about shape analysis from local information to non-local information and how we can learn from, from single shapes. So um, a brief introduction on what uh, the, kind, the kind of data I'm going to handle here. So we are dealing with sample surfaces, which are point sets acquired from the acquisition of real world objects. Um, and the problem is that it's, there's a variety of, a uh, huge variety of uh, methods to um, to perform the acquisition of a, of a surface. It can be a very precise uh, high accuracy laser scanner. It can be a very low, it can be cheap um, 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 depth camera mounted on a, on a computer, for example. And the outputs are of different qualities. And sometimes they don't even look at the surface. For example, here, uh, that's the Bremen city. And you can see that there are some linear parts uh, and a lot of boundaries. So the surface hypothesis only holds very locally. Whereas for, for, full, for whole objects, and you can see it's, uh, the surface hypothesis is pretty, uh, um, pretty well enforced. Uh, so why do we want to perform local shape analysis? Because we always need some local information such as surface normals, surface curvatures, curvature lines, and so on. So here you have an example of curvature lines, rich and value lines, um, estimated on, on meshes. So to do all this task, we need to have good um, estimation of different differential quantities. And we need that to be, we need them to be efficient, uh, even if the sampling is irregular, the data is noisy, and there, are, there may be some missing data. So I'll make a few assumptions first. Um, so the surface can be, so we'll assume that we have some sampling of an underlying surface, a mathematical surface, and we'll assume that S can be locally, uh, so the underlying surface S can be locally expressed as a height field over a planar parameterization in neighborhoods of fixed radius R. So if I remove the fixed radius conditions and you just have a mathematical definition of a surface, but the fact that R is fixed, uh, it kind of restrains, uh, uh, constrains the surface. And we'll also assume that S is smooth, uh, infinitely smooth, that's just to be able to, com to compute any derivative we might want to compute. And then we have some condition on the discretization. For example, uh, we have sampling condition, which states that inside the R neighborhood, uh, we need to have enough points and we need to have a noise level, which is lower than the neighborhoods we're going to consider because otherwise we don't have a surface at all. We'll have a, an isotropic point distribution. So there are many ways to represent the surface locally. Maybe the most straightforward, straightforward one is to represent the surface as a height field over a plane. We know it's possible because of our assumptions. So we can just express the surface locally as a, a function h of x and y. And um, we can represent them by simply represent this function as by sampling it on a pattern, on a regular pattern. For example, that's what I did here. So it brings us closer to an image processing case because we trans we, we map a local neighborhood to a local image. And uh, we can do something more clever. We can uh, uh, use a decomposition and a function basis, uh, for example, a Fourier basis or any basis you can well, uh, you, you like. And um, this gives you, through the analysis of coefficients, you can do uh, um, an, an in-depth analysis. 
And uh, there are many, many different function bases that have been introduced over the time for, for representing locally the functions, uh, surface functions. But uh, I'll just present two of them, but there are, it's just, uh, there are many other ways to do so. So the first one I'm going to present is the uh, SQL in Jets, which was introduced by uh, Casals and uh, Pouget in 2003. And the idea is that you have a surface parameterized with respect to a parameterization plane, which is not necessarily the tangent plane. And locally, you can express a, uh, uh, your function as uh, a truncated Taylor expansion. And uh, so the basis is just a set of x uh, to the k minus j, uh, y to the j. And the coefficients, uh, what is good about this, um, this basis is that the coefficients can be linked to derivatives of the function. So by estimating the coefficients, you can get derivatives of the, of the function and you can compute curvatures and uh, curvature lines and every, every any other uh, differential quantities you'd like. But what is important in this paper uh, is not actually Taylor x to Taylor expansion, which was pretty, uh, which is something which is well known, but it, the, the, the real contribution is that they have an accuracy theorem which state that if you have a uh, Taylor expansion of order capital K in the neighborhood of radius R, um, the precision at which you can uh, get the all K, uh, small K order derivatives is at this following precision is in uh, uh, small O of R to the capital K minus small K. So it states that if you want to have curvatures, that's order two, you still need to go as high as you can in order to get a, a, a good uh, accuracy. So it's not enough to go on just to the quadric or, or cubic. Well, it can be enough, but then you have a, a smaller accuracy, a worse accuracy. So in practice, how do you compute that? Well, you do, uh, how do you compute the, the coefficients? You compute the coefficients simply by performing a linear system solve locally around the points in, in the small neighborhoods, neighborhoods around the points. So it's uh, quite easy to compute and uh, then you get uh, the derivatives. There's another basis, which is, uh, which I'm going to talk about, which is a Tsernike polynomials, which is much older. Uh, it's uh, based from the 30s years, so 1934. And uh, it's, it's much, much more complicated because uh, it introduce, introduces a basis which depends on like a complex exponential and a polynomial in R. So it depends on R and theta. And it was initially introduced to represent the chromatic aberration um, on the lenses, on lenses. So it's pretty efficient at uh, emphasizing the, um, some frequency component around the normal. So that's pretty, uh, that's a pretty nice feature. And another nice feature is that uh, it's, uh, it's orthogonal and the magnitude of the coefficient to compute, so you can compute them by linear system solve in the same manner as you computed the coefficients for those quicking jets. And the magnitude of the coefficients is rotation invariant. Uh, so it's, it's important because when you take a different um, origin for the theta angle, then you can have uh, the coefficients that are the amplitude of the equation, which is which remains the same. And it's, it's nice because it's, uh, it removes the problem of choosing the right origin of the angles. And of course, it's linearly related to escalating jet coefficients, but the, the, the linear transform to go from the one to the other is very, very complicated. So we're not going to, uh, to look into that. So there is still a drawback for this, uh, for this uh, basis, which is that there is no explicit link between, uh, the, between, the, between the coefficients and the differential quantities, which we are pretty easy to get from the skating jets. So that's something we might want to fix. And to fix that, we try to take the better, best of both worlds and introduce the wave jets, which, are, uh, which is a very simple uh, function basis, basically r to the k e uh, and then complex exponentials. So it, it splits basically the um, function into a uh, polynomial um, evolution in r and uh, some frequency components 
uh, around the normal. So through K, we'll get direct access to derivative of, of order K. And through N, we'll get a direct access to uh, some angular frequency component. So this way, we kind of bring together um, nice um, properties of both spaces. So locally, we can express the function as a uh, coefficients uh, phi, uh, phi kn uh, times the function basis. And we have a truncated version. And then, uh, of course, the phi kn have some weird uh, expression here. But we're not going to look too much about the, uh, uh, to, to, uh, we are not going to look too much uh, on that. We're going to just uh, estimate them and see what we can um, get out of them. So let's just have a look at the first uh, basis functions. So if we take um, 0, 0, so it means that there is no radial evolution. So it's constant, uh, constant polynomial. And no uh, frequency evolution. So it means that your basic list stays the same all around the normal then naturally we get the plane. Now, if we take an order two polynomial and zero for the frequency, we get a parabola because, uh, well, there is no, it's completely invariant by rotation around the normal and it's, uh, it evolves uh, in R2. Now, if we take two, uh, still an order two polynomial, but uh, an order two uh, frequency of two, we'll have two maxima and two minima, and this gives you the horse saddle. Um, if we have uh, order one polynomial and uh, frequency one, we have one extrema, one minimum, one, one extrema, one minimum, and we'll have uh, basically a plane, a rotated plane. So we, if we encode basically the deviation uh, to the parameterization plane, then we have a, uh, a shape which is not known. We call it the, we call it the, the armchair because it looks like the armchair, but that's just us. And then if we have an, an order three polynomial and another three uh, frequency, then you get a uh, monkey saddle, like with three maxima, three minima, and uh, each time it's uh, an order three polynomial. So with this uh, decomposition, you get, uh, you get access to very um, well-known uh, basis surfaces. And then when you decompose a point on the surface, you have a decomposition into parabola, uh, that's the armchair, uh, the horse saddle, monkey saddle, and so on. So it's uh, there are some kind of uh, intuitive uh, can, um, way of uh, seeing these spaces. Now, it's uh, what is important about this basis is that we have also a uh, stability theorem, uh, which basically states that if you have a parameterization plane which is different from the tangent plane, and by which is different by an angle gamma then you can uh, write the true coefficient computed on the tangent plane with respect to the one computed on the parameterization plane. And the difference between the two is only uh, gamma times some function, which depends on all coefficients of uh, order and frequency lower than k and n. So uh, this has two consequences. The first one is that you can uh, correct the parameterization plane to get to the true um, uh, tangent plane, and you get so you get an estimation of gamma and an estimation of uh, the uh, the axis. So you can easily correct the uh, parameterization plane into the tangent plane. And the second consequence is that you can uh, correct any coefficient um, from the ones estimated over p to get the one estimated over t, uh, and uh, just by some linear combination of the previous uh, phi coefficient. And so you don't need to rotate your, uh, your plane and recompute everything. You can just rotate your plane and update the coefficients. And that will, that will that's much easier. And in particular, we can have that the order two coefficients, the polynomial order two, coefficients are pretty stable with respect to gamma. And that will be useful because those are di directly linked to mean curvatures and Gaussian curvatures. So if you're, uh, if you're uh, only uh, interested in Gaussian and, cur and uh, mean curvatures, you can express them uh, 
with, uh, with respect to the weight check coefficients. But, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, now, if you're, if, if you're computing everything over the tangent plane, then you have phi 1, 1 and phi 1 uh, minus 1, which are equal to 0, uh, because uh, there is no deviation. Uh, and in that case, the, the way the curvatures write are much easier. So uh, the coefficients, here are the coefficients when you introduce some noise on the normals. And you see that all, so the points stay stable. So we just add noise to the normal. Um, the normals. And what you have is that it's uh, pretty stable with respect to the noise. Coefficients are pretty stable with respect to the noise, except, so the one which is obviously getting all the noise is phi 1 1, and which is consistent with our, the idea that uh, phi 1 1 encodes a difference from tangent plane to uh, parameterization plane. So experimentally, it, it fits a theory, which is something we like. Uh, so it's uh, also uh, the weight jets are also permit to introduce new integral invariants. So an integral invariant is something you can compute uh, locally by aggregating measures at a certain scale, and uh, which is invariant with respect to a translation and rotation of the of the surface. So it was originally introduced originally introduced by uh, uh, in two thousand six by Mani for images and Potman and Luke Potman worked a lot on. on on that in 2007-2009. Uh, and in particular, he introduced um, an integral, in integral invariant, which is the sine volume between the surface and uh, tangent plane. And here, um, we are interested in aggregating all coefficient phi kn for a fixed fre frequency n and var varying uh, polynomial order k. And uh, you can see with, with a time sum s, which basically encodes the scale at which, we're, uh, which, at which we are looking at the coefficients. And each a n of, um, and the amplitude of a n of s is an integral invariant at scale s. So uh, this means that uh, we can compute them pretty efficiently either uh, by uh, local integration or Monte Carlo or uh, uh, there are many, many ways uh, to do so, but we have some efficient way of computing the, of computing this integral invariance. And uh, this gives you, this uh, gives us uh, some application. And the first one is detail and detail enhancement. And uh, there are, we are considering two ways of amplifying the details of modifying the details. The first one is to modify directly the points, position, the point positions. And the second one is to try to just amplify the normals. So the first one will try to amplify the curvatures. And the second one is going to try to amplify how fast the normal moves on the surface. And to do so, we will use only A0 and A1. Uh, so the first, uh, first position-based detail enhancement is quite easy. You take a point P and you amplify it by uh, adding uh, some, some quantity along the normal and the quantity is directly uh, uh, dependent, it's, it's uh, linearly dependent on uh, the first uh, on A0, so it's an integral invariant. And then you get, uh, so you get this kind of results, so you see that the details are enhanced. Uh, a disclaimer, though, there is no guarantee that the surface is not intersecting, self-intersecting. Of course, points are moved each, uh, each one independent, each, each point is moved, moved independently. So I'm pretty sure that if you look very closely at the surface, you'll see self-intersecting problems. But when you render the points, then it, it does, they don't appear. And now if you do the, try to do the same with normals, so you try to make normals evolve faster than they are, what you see is that, uh, uh, so it's slightly more complicated. You, you can't just uh, work directly on the normals as you work directly on the, on the point position. What you're going to do instead is work on um, the coefficient phi 1, 1, which encodes uh, basically how far the normal is to the true tangent plane. The estimated normal is to the true tangent plane. 
and uh, you can modify it by a quantity that is uh, linearly dependent, proportional to a uh, a plus or minus one. And once you have modified the coefficient phi one one, you can uh, use the same idea as we did for uh, parameterization plane correction, and we and find the new normal that would fit uh, this phi one uh, plus or minus one. And doing so, you get an amplification of the details that does not involve moving any points, but simply the normals. And what is fun about that is, yeah, is that you can not only amplify the details, but you can also skew the normal directions by using, again, and again, alpha one, uh, alpha one or alpha minus one, which is a complex value, which has a complex value. So it looks like you're rotating the details uh, without even moving the points. Or you, you can also invert the details in theory by using a negative uh, thing. So um, this is the results of the uh, armadillo using uh, point-based detail enhancement. And you can see that uh, the, uh, uh, well, basically it's, it looks even uh, uglier than it looked at the beginning. Um, so that's only two applications of, uh, of, the, of our weighted spaces. There are many others that are currently investigating including uh, computing high order direction, uh, principal directions. And uh, these are uh, just a, a, an example application. Okay, so that's local analysis. That's what uh, recent work on local analysis. But now local analysis is intrinsically limited, limited because we use only local information. And if you have a shape which is sampled using a, uh, a scanner laser or any acquisition device, then what you have uh, at the end is only one possible sampling among all theoretically possible sampling you could have, um, have had. So you, you're really dependent on the sampling and you're really dependent on the, on, the, on the device. So let's try to go a little further than that and try to do non-local analysis. So instead of uh, restricting to a local neighborhood, we're going to look all over the surface if we can find repeated patterns and we're going to try to aggregate information from all these uh, repetitions. So it's not a new idea, actually. It was uh, introduced for denoising by uh, Tony Buades in uh, 2006, then extended to meshes by uh, Yoshizawa and colleagues. And uh, in, uh, in, for example, in the work in geometry processing is the work of Zeng, where you try to uh, consolidate kinds via explicit uh, pattern recognition. Um, there are some pretty straightforward way of uh, extending non-local means to point sets. Uh, so here is a, a small result uh, by using a as the description a height map. So uh, it's just a, a rasterized height map. So it gives you a small image and then uh, you compare um, descriptors using the L2 distance, so it's not even a clever distance. And then you try to aggregate, update a point by not only considering its neighborhood, but all points that look similar, that have similar descriptors all over the surface. And then you can get, um, you can get a, a denoising, for example, here that preserves uh, the flat parts and the details and removes well the, the noise. Um, another thing you can do is say that uh, computing a descriptor over a surface, over a, pla a planar, or um, over a plane, might not be the best thing because then you're encoding basically the large scale curvature. So you might want to try to go above that because you'd want to see if a pattern is similar all over the surface. Also, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, the curvature, the large scale curvature changes. So you can try to encode the height over a quadric instead of the height over a plane. And in that case, you can detect similarities even if they are supported by different order two surfaces. And uh, this is slightly more demanding, but not so much. So you can just, it's just a matter of engineering, more engineering, let's say. 
So here are the kind of results you get. You go take the initial shape, you, an initial shape, you degrade it by uh, uh, subsampling, by uh, first, uh, um, first mousing, and then the uh, subsampling, and then you try to apply quadratic super resolution, and you compare it to a uh, robust iterative moving least squares, for example, which is a pretty efficient upsampling method. And you see that the kind of results you get is much more precise. And that's due to the fact that it, it encodes not only local information, but it, it tries to find um, similar areas on the shape and take this information inside uh, as a takes into account for, for the analysis. So it's doing more than just heat interpolation. So that's why it, it works better. It's just it's because it's doing something more than just interpolation. Um, and then uh, there was a uh, um, uh, work we did for compression, which was uh, interesting because uh, it used dictionary learning, which basically uh, was uh, very much studied at, at Perkinen. So I think I'm not going to go much into the technical details for that, but uh, it's an interesting application. So the idea is that you represent locally the surface as a uh, also as a as a as a local um, as a local image. This time it's over uh, a radial grid, but it could work as well with the uh, with a uh, Euclidean grid. So you have this initial patch decomposition, and you use dictionary learning to represent the patches efficiently. And the final data you have is a set of seeds with local trays a small dictionary and a sparse set of coefficients for each patch. So it's pretty um, low in terms of um, uh, memory size. And uh, how does it work? You have an initial sampling. You subsample it to get a set of seeds and you compute the patch for the seeds uh, through a parameter, first a parameterization. Then the patch description are decomposed into coefficients and dictionary small dictionary, prefer, preferably. And you what you encode finally is just a set of uh, seeds location, uh, the parameterization, and coefficients and dictionary. And that way, it's a pretty efficient compression. And the way we did dictionary learning is through uh, KSVD. So it's, uh, it's a uh, work uh, which, is, uh, which was invented in Atherian, I guess. So uh, I'm not going to detail much uh, this, but it's a very clever algorithm where you have a sparse coding step and uh, where you fix a dictionary and update the coefficient and then a dictionary update where you update a dictionary atom by atom while enforcing that the coefficients are still, still, um, are still uh, sparse. So what is good about this um, way of uh, learning uh, from the from the patches is that the results the dictionaries you get are very uh, specific to your to your um, to the shape you're analyzing. So first um, on the left, so th there are the dictionaries built for two different shapes, and you can see that the kind of uh, of uh, so that si only sixteen atoms, and the kind of atoms you get are very different. Well, they are not very uh, not really comparable. And uh, so it's really dedicated to a, to a shape compared to, for example, what you would get if you would use Fourier, which is a completely uh, shape ag uh, agnostic uh, basis. So if you decompose, so if you use this kind of uh, decomposition, you have uh, you get a compression to less than one bit per point with an error which is less than 0.002% of the shape diagonal, so it's uh, pretty low. And uh, it's enough if it's enough for, for usually what we, we do for, for example, shape reconstruction. There are still some um, differences. For example, if you take this shape here, there are some huge scanning artifacts where which are uh, basically scanned super, uh, superimposed uh, artifacts. And uh, if you compress and decompress it, then what you get is that um, you, you have the details which are very well preserved, but you have removed all these small details, all these small artifacts. Actually, they are very, very small, but because we are, our eyes are very, 
sensitive to alignments, we, we, uh, we detect, we see them uh, quite clearly. Of course, if you take this, uh, the Brennan shape I uh, introduced at the beginning, where there are a lot of non-surface parts and boundaries, and you apply all this kind of um, treatment uh, processing uh, I described uh, until now, then you'll see that uh, for here you have some kind of dilation uh, di uh, effect, and you lose uh, the small details. For example, here you had a window, and they are almost completely filled. And that's because you assume that everything is a surface. And of course, that doesn't hold if you are looking at this kind of data. So we need to, to have, uh, we need to build a descriptor which is able to represent mixed dimension cases. And uh, so cases where you have both surface parts and linear parts. Now, if you had an infinite precision laser scanner, of course, you would see that everything here is a surface, but at the scale at which we perform the acquisition, at the scale at which we are looking at the, at the, at the digitized, digitized shape, it makes more sense to consider that the, the ropes and the riggings are a set of lines, entangled lines, and, uh, and try to work with this uh, hypothesis. So to do so, we we'll drop the height function, um, height function uh, way of, uh, computing our descriptors and uh, introduce what we call local probing fields, so LPF, which basically calls the different transformation to be from a generic pattern in the ambient space onto the shape. So you have a generic pattern, which is the blue, this blue distribution here, uh, and we deform it to match the shape. And what we'll encode in the end is this set of um, a green, uh, green vector, which are which is the deformation field. So instead of encoding the shape, we encode a set of deformation, deformation fields. So we need two ingredients to do so. First, we need a probing operator, which is an operator which associates a point in the ambient space to a point on a shape. And we also need a generic pattern. So this is the blue sampling here, which is basically a set of points sampled inside a disk or a sphere and expressed relatively to a center. Uh, so it can be either regular or completely random. It's a, so we're, what we use in our experiments is a regular sampling, but we have we had, we had the experiment uh, as well with a random sampling if it works well. So um, the idea is that uh, you'll just encode the green vectors, and uh, each LPF is just uh, each uh, local probing field is just a vector field which can cause the displacement of generic patterns onto the shape. So of course, there are many ways to, um, uh, to, to set the, um, uh, to place the generic patterns in, in, in the ambient space. So uh, we need some optimization to, to be sure that uh, we are close to the surface and as orthogonal as possible, so that if we are in a surface case, then the local probing, thing, local probing fields tends to degenerate to a, uh, um, to a height map, making the green arrow um, orthogonal to the blue, to the support plane of the generic pattern. And in that case, you can see that you can encode both surfaces and linear parts by having a uh, LPF degenerate to a single line. So uh, that's why we, we need orthogonal, uh, as orthogonal as possible, uh, local probing fields. And to do so, we just uh, restrict P to be uh, to the probing operator to be the point to, to be the, the one that selects uh, the point on the shape that projects closest to each point of the generic pattern. Uh, and this will be enough to ensure at least experimentally some orthogonality. There is still one uh, uh, huge uh, problem, which is there is one, uh, even if the green arrows are orthogonal to, at the, uh, uh, to the generic pattern, uh, which there's still one uh, unknown, which is how far you are going to be to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the surface. And to do so, we also minimize the length of the, uh, uh, of the green arrows, and it will make something like that. So first, you spread uh, generic patterns 
uh, over the shape. And then you use a probing operator to associate each point of the pattern to a point of the shape. And then you try to make the, um, to favor orthogonality. So this one has rotated, this one as well, but this one cannot enforce some orthogonality, so it will not move. And this way you have built uh, some, uh, some description, some local description uh, of, your, of your surface. Uh, and now, how are we going to handle this uh, local probing fields? Where are we going to do dictionary learning similarly at what we did before, at what we did before? So we are going to learn uh, from the set of LPF. So all, you gather all the uh, local probing fields, and you're going to try to learn something from that. And the way we're going to do to do dictionary dictionary learning again. So we are going to both look for a dictionary of D atoms and a sparse set of coefficients. So that's what we exactly the same as we did before. But we're also going to try to optimize for the poses that best enforce a consistent representation while not allowing them to not allowing the generic patterns to drift too much over the surface. So how can we state that mathematically? It's just an optimization problem. We have a dictionary learning problem, which is quite classical. Uh, the only difference with before is that you have an L1 uh, term on the an L1 um, um, penalty on the coefficients instead of L0. It's slightly easier to, to optimize. And then what is less uh, what is uh, less uh, usual is that we also uh, optimize for um, the, the, represent, the representation of the LPF itself by uh, allowing it to move or rotate uh, while still um, accounting for the same area of the shape. And then the way we, we can resolve this minimization is just uh, by iterating until convergence. It's a dictionary learning step, so solve for D and alpha. Uh, dictionary and coefficients, then solve, uh, try to f optimize the pose of the LPF so that uh, you have some, uh, so you're still trying to optimize this uh, representation error. So you try to make the LPF move as close as possible to its decomposition. And then the third step is to uh, perform an update of the local probing fields by uh, updating taking the new pose of the generic patterns and recomputing the LPF. So if you just consider the two first steps, those, uh, the energy can only decrease. The third step can make the energy increase a little, but experimentally we found that it was uh, uh, still in general, the, the minimization went well. So let's see how, wh why, we, what, why it's interesting. So here is a set of uh, initial local probing fields that are completely random at the beginning on a toy example, which is a sinusoid. And then you start, start the minimization. And what you see is that the minimization tends to align local probing fields with the shape similarities so that, uh, um, so that uh, areas that are similar are represented in a similar way. So you have an orientation which is completely uh, similar, which is completely aligned. Uh, and that way you are sure that the description here matches the description there, which makes sense because this is exactly the same detail, just uh, at a different location. So that's why it's, uh, this, is, uh, this step is interesting. Um, so let's uh, just uh, skip the optimization and uh, look at what we get out of this analysis. We have um, a sh that shape, which is a hollow cube with a line crossing it. And in the, in the dictionary, you can see that you find the, um, uh, a, the, the basically an edge of a cube and also a degenerated line, a degenerated uh, local probing field. So a line, basically a line shape, which will be, encode, which will be encoding the, lines itself, the line itself. And as an application, you can do shape resampling, for example, resampling from the consolidated LPFs. So that gives you uh, this kind of results. So what is interesting here is that, for example, the, 
the boundaries of the um, of the windows are, are well uh, are well reconstructed, and sometimes, uh, for example, uh, here. So basically, it's obviously a plane, but because we acquired it with a lidar, um, there are some parts which are lines, uh, which are far from the lidar uh, position, and which are lines here, and closer. Then it looks much more like a surface, and if you resample that then it will take the decision, it will guess that you have a plane here, but uh, but there, since it's, since it's uh, at the scale at which it's looking at the data, uh, these are only uh, lines, it will just uh, resample lines. So it, ten it tends to respect the original sampling uh, distribution of the shape. And if you take the, 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 the boat uh, I, I showed earlier, you can see that the LPF is basically the one, the only one that can uh, resample uh, the data uh, while keeping the uh, point distribution. Um, in that, that's uh, so that's uh, edge aware resampling by uh, Huang in uh, 2013, and you can see that it enforces like, some kind of surface assumption, which is uh, which is part of what the algorithm do. So it's completely normal. And uh, anisotropic MLS is just a modification of MLS by uh, considering uh, both curvatures and uh, taking a decision whether it's a line or a, uh, uh, or, a, or, a, or a plane. And you can see that it's much, much more blurry than uh, our result. Um, if you resample the holo cube, then you see the kind, same kind of, uh, of artifacts for. Uh, for surface um, methods, like uh, this kind of, uh, of artifact here, whereas, whereas uh, in our case, we're really able to resample the lines properly. And uh, beyond the resampling, we can also do shape, uh, shape uh, denoising by uh, using this uh, following information, uh, immunization. You try to find a shape which is close to the noisy one, so that's a data attachment term. And uh, you try to have uh, to enforce that the uh, local probing fields of the denoise shape are close to the to the dictionary decomposition, and the third, third uh, term is just uh, enforcing that uh, your coefficients are sparse. So the way it works is that you fix the surface, you run uh, the dictionary and alpha, and you the LPF poses as before, and then uh, you fix. Uh, the alpha and the LPF poses, and you find the best denoise point size. So it writes actually the optimization writes quite simply if you if you decompose it and, uh, and uh, if you decompose it. So uh, you can just uh, find the denoise post point position as an, an average of uh, the initial point position and some um, some average of all denoise um, position proposed by the LPFs. So it's uh, quite easy to implement. It's not as efficient as a really like bilateral filter or any more modern uh, shape um, uh, denoising method for surfaces. Like uh, so, that's a fan disk. You see, it's it's okay, but it's really not state of the art. If you take um, shapes that are maybe a little more um, so it's, um, with the more sampling problems, then you get results that are a little better. So it's a little more competitive. But where it's really competitive is where, of course, you consider uh, shapes that are a, a mix of, um, a mix of uh, surfaces and linear parts. And in that case, well, any other um, methods, so that's uh, the noisy um, shape. APSS is uh, algebraic uh, point set surfaces uh, by uh, Genebo in 2007. 2007. Our, uh, our IMLS is um, um, uh, robust iterative modeling squares by uh, Osterley in 2009. And the bilateral filter is the one from uh, Fleischmann in 1999. Um, and WLOP is by Huang in 2011, if I'm not mistaken. And all, all of them. Um, tends to either denoise the shape or denoise well the linear parts, but not both, while, while our method can, can do both. So 
so that's where it's really efficient. So to conclude, um, I showed uh, various ways to perform local and non-local analysis. So I know there was not any deep learning in, in the learning part of the, of the talk, but that's uh, really something uh, we can do because with this description, we, we could do uh, uh, learning from shape in an end-to-end -end manner, because if you think about it, the LPF is non-destructive in a way that you can resample exactly uh, under some, some sampling condition. You can resampling from an LPF decomposition. You can really uh, completely revert the process and resample exactly the shape. And so we can handle manifold and some non-manifold cases uh, well. And if you want to play with that, you have the codes which are available on my, on my web page. So thank you a lot. And uh, if you have some questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you, Julie. Uh, unfortunately, there's no clapping. Um, if somebody has a question, please unmute yourselves and uh, speak up. Um, in the meantime, perhaps, or just uh, put it in the chat if you don't want to speak. Perhaps I'll ask a quick question. Um, regarding the basis functions in the beginning, the wave jets. Yeah. So uh, basis functions, which are really popular these days are spectral basis for, yes. you know, Laplace. But did you guys think about considering, uh, you know, like uh, using them at different levels of resolution, like for the higher resolution, use the wave jets, for the low resolution, use spectral basis, kind of combining them? Yeah, uh, it's, um... It's, uh, it's doable. Um, the thing is, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how we would, uh, we would um, link the two because both encode very different information. Mm -hmm. um, so you will have some um, high level um, whole shape basis. And then my, my the kind of thing I'm not, I'm not sure about is how we do we transfer information to, to the lower smaller mm -hmm. scale of the wave jets because um oh yeah it's uh it, I, we, we thought about that so we, we 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 actually considered using functional maps and wave jets and see how it it would fit together but we didn't come uh, come up with a with a very uh, yeah like with a, with a clear way of um and compelling way of uh, of linking both i guess you're missing the in between level yes right? exactly yeah yeah, yeah. Because this is too low and this is too high, so yeah, we need something else in between. So for, for people <laughs> listening, this is like future work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, somebody else wants to ask something. Your time suggested that everybody unmutes and claps. I, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I'm not opposing. Uh, feel free to do that. Um, okay, so perhaps I'll ask another question. You reminded me with the. Um, the last descriptor, like the external one that takes into consideration, uh, you showed this uh, sinusoidal thing that converges to a very similar uh, orientation on all of them. So ca can you use uh, this kind of thing for, for example, for poly polycubes or for analyzing, you know, like if you have a shape, you want to analyze like uh, main axes that are uh, appear a lot in, in all, uh, in a fixed set of directions, something like that. Um... Yeah, the only thing is that it will be very local because yes. uh, if you take a too large uh, radius, then you'll, uh, well, basically the surface assumption doesn't hold. And then uh, your orientation might be, uh, no, sorry, <laughs> my mistake. Uh, we are talking about the LPF. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. We, we could definitely use that for, so it's, it's we could definitely use that to find uh, nice, uh, nice directions and, um, yeah, and uh, repeated directions. But mm -hmm. this would be, uh, I'm not sure how at a large scale, how uh, important it would be, how different it would be from computing a single PCA, for example. Yeah. So locally, it will really tend to have this kind of intrinsic orientation, um, to build this intrinsic orientation, even in a non-manifold case, but, uh, but at a larger scale, uh, probably it will not do something much different than, than PCA. Okay. Also, yeah. also you can uh, you can uh, you can initialize what we did for 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 demonstration is to initialize orientation randomly. 
but mm -hmm. actually you, you can do something a little if you want to be faster if you want the conversion to happen faster you can initialize with pca it's, uh, it's it makes more sense yeah but, but it's convincing that it converges from random yeah. it's always yes. a good uh, mm -hmm. okay thank you julie uh I guess if there are no more questions, then uh, I'll thank everyone for coming. The recording will be on YouTube and we'll uh, link them from the seminars webpage. So uh, thank you again. Bye-bye.